Hello everyone, we are continuing our discussion on the Pahari paintings and here we are. So, uh, we, we started talking about this specific characteristic of the Pahari paintings where we see the tantric uh, philosophy and the, uh, and, the, and the veneration of the great goddess have been uh, much more prominent than some of the other uh, regions from where we find the manuscript and the miniature paintings. So, the one we see here on screen, the one in the left side of the screen here is a depiction of the, uh, the triumphant great goddess Bhadrakali and uh, so this is this we find that was produced in the the court of Basholi and in the in the mid 17th century and in this one what we find that there is the depiction of the great goddess Bhadrakali and she is uh, depicted as this dark skinned goddess who has uh, prominent eyes and then she wears a garland of lotuses and then she uh, is standing on a shower or a corpse. So, this this idea about like uh, incorporating the, the dead bodies, the corpse and the idea of shower and uh, how uh, um, on this horizontal uh, way the shower lies on the ground and the, the way like the Shakti or the great goddess she is the one that, that stands vertically on the top of it and that is how life starts. So, from, from the dead to the starting of the life how the energy of the great goddess is required. So, all those ideas we find them to be um, you know celebrated in this Pahari miniature paintings. It is not to say that in the other parts of the country uh, the Indian subcontinent they did not explore these ideas, but in, in, in the Pahari miniature paintings, we, we do see that them prominently um, you know explored and addressed. So, we see that I mean Bhadrakali, she is here and she, she uh, is, is someone who is fierce at the same time she is the one with the great knowledge and that is the reason in one of her um, the, uh, the upper right arm, uh, uh, in the upper right hand we find that I mean she holds a manuscript. So, manuscript is a is a symbol of knowledge of learning. So, it, it is something that we find that I mean how this this idea of the shower or this corpse and then the uh, you know and bringing this this fierce goddess there at the same uh, picture plane with the shower and then also this this indication of their relationship to intelligence. So, all these different layers of understanding and philosophy they are coming they, they come together in these paintings and then we find the central figure is placed within this gleaming sun and the sun is perhaps been produced with uh, painted with, with gold color. So, it is like a golden sun and that, that suggests that the gleaming presence of Bhadrakali the goddess and we see that the entire image is framed within this arch architectural Jharokha like window. So, this Jharokha window that, that we have seen that uh, in the in the presence of the uh, you know how, how this particular kind of windows they are explored in the uh, Rajput architecture and then was also adapted in the Mughal architecture. So, they are also something we find them to be uh, you know incorporated in the painted representations as well. So, here the Jharokha window is used as a pictorial frame to have the central deity at the center. The other image here in the um, you know in the right side of the uh, screen we find this is an image of um, Shiva and Parvati's family and then we find that Shiva and Parvati's family are uh, placed in a cremation ground where there is a, a corpse which, which is still burning and then there are jackals and other animals who, uh, who sort of uh, inhabit this cremation ground and there we find the happy family of Shiva and Parvati, they, they, they also inhabit the same place. So, it is a kind of a juxtaposition between different ideas about life and death and how these ideas are not really distinct from each other. So, those kind of things are celebrated in the Pahari paintings.
Now, in terms of the uh, the um, you know in in terms of the practice, we also find that the pahari miniature paintings have also flourished side by side with mural making. And for example, we have some of the painters like Golu. Um, the very celebrated painter who held from Nurpur in again in the in, in the Kangra region, and then we find that I mean he had uh, he had um, painted the murals of the Brijaraj Swami Temple in Nurpur Fort, and at the same time we also have miniature paintings which were painted by the same person. So the person who was involved in making the mural paintings, and here we have some of the written records that suggest that I mean the same person was involved in painting miniature paintings as well. So that is how we know that uh, there was a close correlation between mural making and uh, miniature painting making. And in the time we also find that the artisans from the Pahari region they have traveled to the mainland and also to, toward, uh, to the plains and also perhaps some of them uh, got to learn about the, the practices of the Mughal miniature paintings and that is how we find that some of the sophistication, some of the ways in which we see that the very minute depiction of the natural elements around us and then like I mean being attentive to all possible details in the human bodies as well as the different objects in nature, the way we see them to be, uh, you know, to have established in the Mughal miniatures. So those things we find them to be in the Pahari miniature paintings as well in the later times. So for example, we have Pandit Seu who traveled to uh, the plains and he, he practiced in the Guler area and then from there we find that, uh, the, you know, he, uh, his, his son. Uh, who also sort of carried out that kind of practice where this minute naturalistic depiction of the different uh, flora and fauna they were brought together with uh, blended with the Pahari philosophy and this this particular way of life where life and death are not really considered to be uh, distinct from each other. So, we find that I mean Pandit Seu's son Nayan Sukh had also continued this this line of thought and line of painting practice and he uh, is someone who started his uh, career in the court of Guler and then we find that I mean he had moved to Kangra and later on with the with the rulers to uh, other places. So that is how we find that uh, this, this particular figures they have contributed immensely to the flourishing of the this this Pahari aesthetic. So, as part of the Pahari aesthetics, except for the this this sinuous lines and this eye for detail and the of course like I mean this philosophical take on on life and death. Apart from these things, we also find that there is this uh, the color scheme is also something that is very uh, subdued and um, not not subdued I should say subtle and then that is also something that uh, that gives a very distinctive uh, presence. Uh, as compared to the brighter color palette of the Rajput miniature paintings. So, in the later times in the uh, in 18th century, we find that there were also some of the themes which were celebrated and these themes would include Rasamanjari and Rasik Priya. In Rasik Priya series, we have there are some of those established um, depiction of the um, of, of Krishna and Radha and the Nayaka and Naika series and then there are also uh, these poetic expressions on longing on the lovers and the different kind of emotions they go through. So all these different things we find them that how the poetry, the literary works they also served uh, as, as reference, as point of reference for uh, making these paintings. So Rasik Priya series and those ones we find them to be much, much prevalent in, um, you know, in, in the Pahari miniature paintings here as well. And here we find that uh, in, the, in the left side of the image, again this, this very subtle color scheme, there is not really too much of contrast there and then um, the narrative elements, we find them to be uh, not too many things things are taking place at the same place. So the narrative elements we find them to be uh, sort of more concentrated towards the central figures and they are also framed within this Jharokha window. So framing the figures within the Jharokha window as we have also seen in the earlier image of Bhadrakali. So similar kind of practices we find them to be also practiced in the later times as well. So 
we find that how uh, this the the creation of the mood is something that was excelled and that was that that was something that was experimented with in the for in the in the court of kangra and guler and and the artisans they have uh, certainly excelled this 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 skill of depicting uh, you know this this mood and emotion and how those are expressed by the bodily gestures and facial expressions in this uh, the central figures or the protagonists that we find them. The other kind, uh, I mean, I should not say the other kind, but I mean the other image that we have in the right side of the screen and in this one we have a depiction of uh, an Avisarika Naika. So, Avisarika is someone who goes out to meet her lover in the night and uh, by um, going against different kind of obstacles. So, the obstacles are usually been uh, depicted uh, in form of the wild animals, snakes and, and sometimes they are also been shown uh, uh, in, in form of the dark clouds, stormy nights, thunderstorm and, and rain and how the Abhisarika Naika um, uh, ignores or like avo avoids all of these things and then still she goes out to meet her lover. So, this is this is something that we also find that how the, the poetry those are written on these themes on, on love and longing and separation. So, those things also have contributed immensely to the making of this kind of paintings. Now, in this painting what we find that there is a sense of movement that was created. So, the Abhisarika Naika we find that I mean she uh, tries to uh, cover her head with her, uh, her dupatta or, or this, uh, or this uh, scarf and and then uh, there are, there are dark clouds in the sky and and uh, the, there are like the snake like forms in the in the in the dark clouds which are perhaps the depiction of a thunderstorm and uh, then uh, we find that there is a there is a peacock who, which sits on the top of this uh, marvel pavilion and so this is the, the peacock is also someone who's uh, pe peacock is also a bird which is which is associated with the arrival of monsoon and then uh, how that 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 also uh, says something about the particular season which is known for which holds much relevance for the lovers who are separated from each other so that is how the entire mood is created and then the dynamism and and the color scheme everything all of them they contribute towards the mood. So, this, these are some of the char characteristic features we find them to be in the, uh, in the, in the 18th century Pahari miniature paintings. So, moving on from there, we are looking into the, the state which are there at the, at the northern frontier of the Indian subcontinent and from there, if we come towards the southern part, we find there was a very different kind of practice those were taking place. So, in the southern India and mostly in the, in the courts of Mysore in Tanjavur, we find that there were, uh, there, there were already some of the painting practices those were established. So, for example, we have some of the mini uh, some of the mural practices in the in the Vijayanagara kingdom and after the Vijayanagara kingdom uh, after the fall of Hampi in uh, so after the fall of Hampi we find that there were smaller kingdoms which sort of came into prominence and then the Nayaka are under the Nayaka rulers we find the painting practices have flourished. Now, in the 18th and later on in the 19th century, what we find that there was uh, already a prominent presence of the British troops and at the same time there were already some of the, um, you know, the British artists and British materials which were available there and not only just British but also the French material, the Danish materials, art materials and different kind of prints and everything those were um, available to them. So, during this time we find that there was a kind of amalgamation between the 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 western european aesthetics with the with the one that was prevalent in southern india and those are the uh, grounds on which we find that the the schools of mysore and tanjavur have flourished so in mysore we have uh, the wodeir uh, kings 
who had their close alliance with the British and then after uh, uh, after the fall of Tipu Sultan we find that the uh, Wodeers have have uh, you know have have managed to have their their status as the princely state and then um, for those things we find that there was many different kind of influences which which we can uh, trace them uh, to this to this uh, exchange between the the indigenous uh, painting style or the painterly style a uh, prominent in southern india with the ones from western europe so for example the one will be definitely the perspectival view and then also the different kind of depiction of the architecture which which came into prominence only in the 18th century and and then also like the depiction of different kind of figures and the color scheme all of them those things have become a much more um, you know catering to the new mo this hybrid mode of um, picture making so uh, this this image that we have on screen that comes from the darya daulat bagh and that was the summer pa that was the palace of uh, tipu sultan and in uh, that is in shiranga patana near mysore and so similar kind of uh, pictorial exercises we find them to be uh, you know like i mean practiced in on paper as well and sometimes in the mysore paintings we also find that how additional material for example like gold plate and different kind of like semi precious jewels and things like that they are added on the top of it to give this this low relief like effect and that that gives a three dimensionality in this images so the three dimensionality is something that that we can imagine that how that that was a response towards uh, the earlier painting practices that uh, persisted in southern india at the same time the 3d modulation of the bodies those are also prevalent in the western european painting traditions so from there if we move on to the court of tanjore or tanjavur so tanjore is the anglicized uh, um, you know version of the word tanjavur so tanjavur was a state in in the um, you know tanjavur uh, is the kingdom that we find uh, that that was um, the state of tanjavur is there in the kaveri delta and that is today in the state of tamil nadu and in tamil nadu that we find that there were many paintings those are produced and uh, for for the maratha uh, the ruler who who ruled in this areas in the 18th and 19th century and these are some of the images that we find those paintings were actually produced for the officials for the british officials for the western european officials and the way this paintings we see them here they actually um, marks a difference from the kind of images those are produced for manuscript for uh for for um, you know the folios which are used by the uh, by the uh, the rulers of the states so this kind of paintings we find those were um, perhaps commissioned by the company officials the british east india company officials and here what we find that they were interested to have visual depiction of different kind of caste occupation and different kind of practices in the indian subcontinent which were alien to them and that is how we find that how there were those um, uh, you know the 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 images in tanjavur the images in tanjavur that they, they came and those those were perhaps been produced by the indigenous artisans and and how they they marked a stark difference from the kind of printing practices in the southern indian courts as well as in other parts of the indian subcontinent so if we go with the aesthetics of this image so you can see that how the sky is actually taking over a large part of the image here and that is something that is a very distinctively western european influence and then we find that there are only few figures they are depicted in the foreground of these images for example here we find that the there are those hindu mendicants and and the ascetics who uh, perform different kind of practices for like uh, you know uh, the the self harm so they here we find that all these figures they are they are actually walking on coal and uh, the the coal is burning and one can see that i mean how this this devotee is still walking on the top of it so that kind of practices which the western europeans were unaware of so those things 
were um, you know documented in these paintings. Similarly, here is also another image in the right side of the uh, page where there are other two uh, figures in which we find that uh, how the uh, this this one figure who's uh, you know uh, sort of like I mean uh, harming his own skin and and that is also part of uh, perhaps like I mean that is that is also part of like I mean their uh, practice to show their veneration towards their uh, uh, their deities. So those kind of things instead of like I mean depicting the royals or someone who is uh, very prominent in the state, the way we have seen in the miniature paintings mostly, here we find that there is a shift in terms of the aesthetics, also the use of the sky, then the mode of narration and also the people who are represented. So the, the uh, this, this company officials, they were interested more in terms of the depiction of the different kind of caste groups, different kind of occupation the peculiar things which were not really uh, evident to them earlier. So those things became the subject matter of these paintings and these paintings we can clearly say how they served more kind of a documentative purpose than of um, the way we see that the uh, you know the, the, the of uh, how the miniature paintings or the manuscript paintings have uh, um, you know persisted and, and um, you know like I mean uh, were, were perceived by the rulers as well as the audience for centuries. This is another image from which shows a Hindu mendicant again and there is a woman who is uh, you know dressed in this shalwar kameez like attire. And another thing that we find that I mean how this these two figures for their the textiles that they wear and then the peculiarity in their in their attire, their uh, ornaments and everything all those things are uh, you know celebrated in this painting. At the same time we also find there is a depiction of the shadow. And depiction of shadow is something that we do not really see in the Indian paintings, the paintings in the Indian subcontinent before the arrival of the, um, of the Europeans. So this is something we find that is to be a unique characteristic feature so of these paintings, those are produced during this time. And of course, we can also think about the use of this open clear sky and the sky almost becomes a background so that I mean there is no other narrative element nothing to restrict the viewer's eyes from appreciating or observing the main figures those are produced, uh, those, those are depicted in the foreground of these paintings. So the, the nature of these paintings for its documentative purpose and at the same time a blend of the, the uh, you know the southern Indian aesthetics with the western European picture making conventions, those things we find that to be prevalent and also celebrated in these images. So to wrap up the session, I would say that I mean there are many different ways in which we can see that how uh, this, this painting practices uh, on paper have flourished in the Indian subcontinent. So we started talking about that some of the earliest surviving examples on paper, for example the one from Gujarat, the Kalpasutra manuscript and there we have seen how uh, this, this new arrival of paper was incorporated in making these manuscripts which were earlier produced on palm leaf and that is how the format of making this manuscript on the palm leaf that stayed and then some of the uh, marks which were made for punching the palm leaf and so on they were trans uh, you know they, they, they were translated into the decorative motifs on paper and from there we have also seen some of the things for example this uh, the the bhagavata uh, uh, you know the, the the bhagavata series and in in which we see that i mean uh, some of the characteristics of making these pictures for example the use of flat colors and then how to make contrast between the different colors and then also that how uh, the, the figures in profile they, they can be utilized for, for continuing a narration. So if there is a frontal figure, usually the frontal figures we find them to be only as part of depicting uh, the godly, um, you know the divine figures or if 
one devotee is seeking blessing from a uh, from a deity then only we find that there are frontal figures of the of the gods but usually the gods and the goddesses but usually for for depicting a narrative scene and even for the royals we find the portraits are done from profile and that is how uh, these images actually um, uh, you know animate a story so we are talking about a time when definitely like the digital technologies were not present and so the idea of animation we find that they were activated through the depiction of these figures in profile also the way in which like I mean the gestures of hand and body and then the expression in their face and at the same time the movement of the other elements in the picture how all those things contributed towards animating these images and, uh, and making these narratives more close to life the way we see that in this this Bhagavata series in which like there is a procession we find uh, which which is moving towards the city of Dwaraka. The other characteristic we have also uh, studied in these images and that is to do with the uh, the use of scripture, the use of inscription and, and the images. So there are like I mean the, the calligraphers will be the ones who will be uh, working on um, uh, you know making the scriptures and making the inscriptions by the images and then like there are the painters, the dedicated painters who would be uh, involved in um, you know painting this. Uh, um, um, you know this this uh, the visual narratives so this is this is a way in which we find that these paintings from the very early times they were produced as a collaborative gesture it was not really something that one person is a completely uh, you know responsible for completing one particular work but it was one paper would go around in the entire workshop and that is how like one image would be produced and uh, if it is part of a manuscript then one can imagine that it's not just the people who are involved in painting but also uh, the, the, the calligraphers and so on they will also be involved in it and this is something we have also studied in the in the context of the Mughal miniature making practices in the Karkhana practice in which we have this workshop setting where the master artisans will be involved in um, teaching the um, you know the, 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 uh, the apprentices how, how things are done and then the teaching is also something that entails uh, a um, understanding of different kinds of paper how to make paper how to paste one paper with the other and then this this particular way of making this handmade paper called wasli and then uh, the way in which like i mean pigment is produced for for painting for calligraphy how ink is produced all those things would be part of uh, painting so so understanding paper understanding painting and and also that how they can be incorporated for expressing certain ideas expressing the the literary works at the same time some of the uh, contemporary socio political events all those things that uh, you know those were they all those things required for a sound understanding of how the materials work and how to make use of this material for painting onto them so this is this is um, apart from this these things we have also seen that in the in the later half of in the later segment of this lecture that uh, with the arrival of the western european aesthetics that even though that was also there in the some of the paintings in mughal court or in the courts of deccan but but uh, a much more uh, a direct uh, patronage of by the by the company officials that we find that how that also gave a very different kind of um, um, you know visual uh, language to to uh, the, the subject matter which were which were there in southern India for example the the Hindu mendicants and and the ascetics that we have seen as as part of the uh, paintings produced in Tanjavur or Tanjore so this is how we find that the um, you know the varied expressions starting with like the manuscripts to the folios to these paintings which were made for documentative purpose so the range is really wide when we understand the use of paper in the indian subcontinent and how those were very differently handled and they this to to serve different purposes where where um, 
practiced and explored and, and um, you know, that is how we find this rich diversity of the Indian paintings today. Thank you. Thank you.